الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And where I left off was after the death of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uncle Abu Talib who was protecting him up to this point. It was in the 10th year of prophethood. Shortly after, his beloved wife Khadija radiallahu anha died and he was extremely sad for their loss. I think it was Ibn Abbas who said and a number of other companions that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stayed for six months not speaking too much because he was saddened for the loss of his wife Khadija bint Khawarid radiallahu anha. Once, to illustrate how much he loved her and never forgot about her, later on, years later, when the Prophet sallallahu was close to 60 years old, he had married Aisha radiallahu anha by that time. And she says, the Prophet never stopped remembering his wife Khadija, even after all these years. And I used to say things that are not so pleasant, but not too rude. And the Prophet used to brush it off. Except for one time, I went a little bit too far. I have to admit, she said, I was a little jealous of that he remembers it even after her death and I'm in front of him. So one day she said, I found the Prophet one day speaking to a very old woman close to her 70s. And it looked like he was talking just social talk. And he was smiling, and she was smiling, and laughing. So after she fin after he finished, I got jealous and asked him, "Woman, tilka la Who is that old woman?" In Arabic, she emphasized the word "old" because Aisha radiallahu is young. And the Prophet sallallahu said to her, "Oh." She used to be one of the friends of Khadija when she used to live. And Aisha radiallahu became even more irritated by that. She said he's even valuing and making time for women who used to be her friends. So she said, I said a statement I should have said. I said, Alam Allahu khayran minha. Didn't Allah give you someone better than her? Me. That's what you mean. The Prophet وسلم, smile vanished. By the way, I forgot to say that he also said to her when I was talking to that old woman, one of her friends, we were talking, reminiscing about the good old days, the ones that passed. I'm talking about her time, you know, remember when this happened, remember when that happened. So Aisha Dhanana said those words. The Prophet smiled and he said to her, Allah has not given me anyone better than her. She gave me shelter when nobody else did, when I had no home. She shared, shared her wealth with me. I didn't have any wealth. She believed me when everybody else disbelieved me. And Allah gave me children from her too. Now that's just to teach Aisha radiallahu a little lesson. Not to repeat these words again. Because Aisha radiallahu didn't have, couldn't have children. So he, he added that just to teach her to remember. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she didn't do any of that stuff. She couldn't do any of that stuff. And she said, 
Ask Allah to forgive me, Ya Rasulullah. I will never say that ever again. She said, after that day, I never said a word about Khadija the Prophet. My brothers and sisters in Islam, so we move on now. This year, which the Prophet uncle and Khadija died in, straight after the boycott, remember the boycott we spoke about, when the Quraysh people, the people of Mecca boycotted the Prophet and his family, and then added to that Banu Hisham, his entire clan, just to put pressure on his entire tribe. It's like a fitna to cause his tribe to hate him for it. But Abu Talib supported him that time, and it's the only reason why his tribe, Banu Hashim, took part. And they were isolated for two years, not allowed to eat from their food or share with their trades or marry from their women or visit from them or socialize with them or anything at all. They were basically as if they don't exist. Two years, and when the boycott was released, just as they received the relief, the Prophet's uncle, who was protecting him for this past 10 years. If it wasn't for his uncle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending his uncle as his protection, the Prophet وسلم, would have been killed. He was protecting. And now that his uncle is gone, that's it. No one can protect him. Because in those days, that's how you survive. You have to belong to a clan and the chief of the clan protects you. His own tribe is against the Prophet The only reason, as I said, is because of Abu Talib's existence. He's dead. Now there is no one to protect the Prophet He's open now. His wife Khadija, who gives him company and helps him morally, and psychologically and emotionally, gone. So he doesn't have a wife, no wife. He never married another woman at the time of Khadija, while he was married to Khadija. So he had no wife. His children were all married. They were girls. They were Muslims. Their husbands were Muslims, but they were weak. There's only a few Muslims around. And they were in secret. If they were to be exposed, then they will also be in trouble. The Prophet's home is at risk. They can attack at any time. His wealth. They can take it any time. So he was at risk in every shape and form. He is among his own people, yet he's basically an outsider, a stranger. Where's he going to go? Remember, the Arabs had to be protected by belonging to your tribe. Where's he going to go? If he goes out of there, there's no other tribe which he belongs to. No one is going to take that risk of protecting him. So they called it Aam al Huzn, the year of sorrow. Till today, it's called the year of sorrow. So, 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 when he found himself unable to live in his own hometown, Mecca, his heart was attached to Mecca. He stayed to the last minute, 10 years, doing everything he can not to leave. He could have gone to Abyssinia. He could have gone to Ethiopia like the rest. But why didn't he? Why didn't he? Because the Prophet's heart is connected to his home. Rasul stayed there for 10 years. But when he saw that his life was at risk, his life or death situation now, he painstakingly had to think of another place to go to just to be protected. That's all it was. It was a matter of life and death. So he looked for the closest place to Mecca that is very close in relationship and very similar style and lifestyle to what he had. So the closest place was a place called Al-Qaif. What is it called? Al-Qaif. Al-Qaif is a very green place. It has greenery. It has fruits and vegetation that grows nowhere else in all of the Ara Arabia except in Al-Qaif. There are fruits and vegetations there that you can't find in Mecca or Medina or anywhere else. And even till today, it's considered a place of tourism for a lot of the Arabs. They go there in the summer, they sit there, and it's a really nice, beautiful place, a resort. In there, there was a tribe called Banu Thaqif. This tribe, Banu Thaqif, was very close in pride and importance 
as the people of Makkah, as, as Quraysh, they were very important, they were very valuable. And they had a god which they worshipped, the ultimate god was called Alat. It was a love hate relationship. Even someone there had married the distant uncle or auntie, sorry, of the Prophet in a thaif. So there was some relationship. So he thought, maybe I can go there and these people will welcome me or at least give me some safe haven. So he went to a thaif. When he reached there, he had sent news with uh, someone to meet with three particular brothers that were chieftains of that place. They had a say. And they agreed to meet him. So when he got there, he met with them. And he spoke to them about his mission as a prophet. He gave them a little bit of da'wah, not too much. And told them, you're free to accept or refuse. What did they do? They had heard about his situation. And instead of welcoming him, they were the most vile and bitter to the Prophet This is all in the same year of his sorrow. Calamities upon calamities. They said foul words to him. The first one said, Well, if you're a messenger of God, I might as well rip the curtains of the Kaaba off him. Sarcastically says, I don't have any belief. I won't accept you. The second one says, out of all people, couldn't Allah choose anyone else but you? The third one said, if you are a, truly a prophet, then you are too holy for me to talk to you. And if you are not a prophet, then my dignity is too high than for you to talk to me. Just sarcastic, stupid words. So the Prophet Sallallahu felt, okay, this is another threat. He's, he's in trouble over there too. So the best thing he said to them was, look, if you're not going to accept, then I ask you for one thing. Please do not tell Quraysh that I came here. And they respected that. They said, okay. And truly, they didn't tell Quraysh that he had gone there. Who was he there with? He took only one man with him. His then adopted son, Zayd ibn Harith. And he chose to walk there. He did not choose to go on a horse or a camel. It's a strategy because then he didn't, he didn't want people to know. He didn't want to you know, make it public. He went on private. It takes you about one and a half hours in a car to reach from Mecca to Abbaif. But it took them about a day or a day and a half to reach there. Deserts, hills, valleys. Also, that the Prophet is not known to have traveled. So, what happened next is the Prophet was refused and rejected. He gave some da'wah. He gave some da'wah to the people in the market. It seemed like some people were accepting Islam, but the majority of them weren't. Especially the chieftains. They wanted to stop this. So, they got scared and they wanted to cause a big problem for the Prophet. Yes, they didn't tell Quraysh, but they went into the city and they started to round up thugs and louts and people, children, women, men, all these people who like to make trouble. They convinced the children to come up and the women and those thuggish men, all with rocks. They, they trapped the Prophet and Zayd in the middle between two rows, one on each side, so that the Prophet can't run away. He goes right, he's stuck. He goes left, he's stuck. Bullies, you know, it's the worst of situations. And you had kids and women and men throwing rocks at them and being vile to them. Zayd radiallahu tried to protect the Prophet but he was smashed everywhere, blood from head to toe. And the Prophet sallallahu blood seeped from all parts of his body until it reached his toes. His blood was between his toes and toes in his leg. Severely, severely injured, injured. So, so, far, so far, a boy, a boy. Uncle dies, wife dies, no home, no money, no family, nowhere to go, and his life is at risk, no protection. Only the clothes he is wearing, no mount, no horse, no camel, no food. 
can't get any worse than that. It was so bad that Aisha radiallahu anha later on, she wasn't, she didn't live at the time of Ta'if when this happened. So she just asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has there ever been a tougher time on you, Ya Rasulullah, than Uhud? The battle of Uhud was very tough. We're going to talk about that weeks to come, inshallah. Was there any rougher time than Uhud? And he said, in very simple words, just briefly, he didn't go into detail to Aisha radiallahu anha. He said, yes, from your people, meaning the Arabs, in a ta'if, I spoke to three of their men and they rejected me and said words that were hurtful. So I had to leave. He didn't say much more than that. And the ulama who speak about this incident, why he didn't say much to Aisha radiallahu anha was, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't want to remember that trauma. He had a trauma from that situation. And he didn't want to talk about it. The first reason. So it's normal for a person who has been through some kind of suffering or trauma, that if they don't want to talk about something, they don't. And it probably helps them not to continue to talk about it. Because each time you bring it up, your brain continues to remember the incident and keep reliving the moment. Psychologically, it's not good to keep talking about it. You need to move on and busy your mind to get your mind busy with other things. Yes, you mourn a little bit in the beginning, you talk about it, and then you've got to move on. Secondly, the Prophet is teaching us that the Prophets and those who follow them do not seek the pity or the sympathy of people. You don't need to complain to people and seek their sympathy. But Rasul Sallallahu doesn't look for sympathy from people or pity. Who does a mu'min complain to? Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. You complain to Allah. And you can talk to really close people. But only for a little while, then you move on. Inshallah, Allah helps. But Zayd radiallahu anhu, because he was there, he spoke a bit more detail. So he, he told us. And what he said was, whatever he can remember. He said, after that incident of throwing the rocks, we tried to run away from them. So we saw a little land that was uh, that had a, a wall around it. It belonged to someone. And in those days, if you enter someone's property, you are protected. No one can touch it unless the owner of the property wants to give you. But he also has to be protected. So it's temporary protection. He said, we sat with our backs on the wall of that garden, it had grapes in it and it had other fruits in it. And we didn't know that it belonged to one of the two chiefs of Mecca, of Quraysh themselves, Utba and Shaiba, his brother. Utba is the father of Hind and Shaiba her uncle. That was a big deal, man. He didn't want Quraysh to know, but that was his land. And Utba had happened to be there looking after his land. The Meccans used to grow crops and, and fruit and vegetation over there in Attar. But unfortunate, but fortunate for the Prophet Utba and Shaiba, what happened to them? They felt bad for the Prophet actually. And Utba, to be honest with you, is normally a good man by nature. But the pride of tribalism took over. And that's the only reason why he was an enemy to the Prophet Utbah, Utbah, was actually a wise man. But he didn't let his wisdom control him. He let the evil control him. He was such a wise man that the Prophet actually acknowledged it in the Battle of Badr. When he told the people, he said, listen, these are our family, these are our relatives. These are, if we kill them, we're killing our own sons, we're killing our own brothers. Tell us, look, we're here, just leave them alone and let them go. And the Prophet ﷺ heard this in the Battle of Badr and he said to his, to his companions, the, it will benefit these people to listen to that wise man. He is a wise man. He acknowledged, even to the enemy, the goodness in their character. That teaches us Muslims to be like that too. So this man, Hutba and Shaiba thought, Muhammad ﷺ is one of us. We can't leave him to these people who are our rivals. To mistreat him, to aib on us, it's, 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 Embarrassing, shame on us. So because of the Arab pride, 
they gave him protection temporarily in the great one, Yam. And they had a slave by the name of Adas. This man, Adas, was a Christian, a proper Christian. And he came from Iraq. There is a city there called Nineveh. Nineveh. And he was taken as a slave. That's very far away from Mecca. Very far away. Nobody knows the Christian belief in Atta'if and Mecca. They, they don't know it. They don't know about prophets. They don't know about all these stories. Not like today we have the internet where people can fly and straight away give you information. Knowledge was really in the city you lived in. If you don't live in that city, you're not going to get that knowledge. And the Arabs didn't know anything about it. Thousands of years, they had no idea about prophets. They don't know anything except for Prophet Ibrahim and Ibrahim. Because of their lineage. So Adas, he's there and his master, Utba, says to him, take this plate of grapes to the Prophet, to Muhammad. My brothers and sisters, just before he took the grapes, I'll tell you a reason why this happened. This was a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Why? There is a famous dua that the Prophet sallallahu made just after they had done that terrible thing to him. You know, all the stuff that's going on in that year. And then this happens to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi And now he's sitting there bleeding from head to toe. He's hit rock bottom. And he's a human himself sallallahu alayhi So we sat at that wall and Zayd says, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa lift his arms up and make the following dua. He said, a long dua, beautiful dua. I'll say part of it. He said, O oh Allah, who have you left me to? To a stranger who ridicules me. Or to a family member who's supposed to be my support, but instead he controls my life now, my life and death. And then he said, O oh Allah, Oh Allah, if you're not angry with me, if you're not angry with me, then it doesn't matter. All of this, we'll forget about it. I don't, I don't care. It's as if the Prophet is saying, like what a normal human would say, Ya Allah, I don't understand. Are you angry with me? Have I done something? What have I done? Ya Allah, he's pleading to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's, he's, He's crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like a little child cries to her, his or her mother or father. They just want their love. Have I done anything to hurt you? Have I done anything to end you? And then the Prophet sallallahu said, لَكَ الْعُتْبَ حَبْتَ تَرْضَ You have the right, my Lord, to, to reprimand me and say anything you want. Tell me off. As long, as much as you want, oh, oh Allah, I accept it until you are pleased. I will accept it so long as at the end of it, you are pleased with me. I just want your pleasure. I just want your pleasure. And he said, But your ease for me is more beloved. He shows us we are allowed as Muslims when you make dua to ask Allah, say, Ya Rabbi, Look, I, I, don't, I don't care about all this calamity so long as you are happy with me. But if you make it easy for me, take the difficulty away from me. That is it. That's more beloved to me, Allah. There's nothing wrong with asking Allah. There's nothing wrong with complaining. Only Allah is the one that we should complain like this to. Now, brothers and sisters, don't get this wrong. There's two ways to complain to Allah. One is kufr. The other one is tawheed. The kufr one is when you call, when you, when you blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what has happened to you. And you question him in a way that is arrogant. You don't accept this. Like when a person says, Why me? Out of all people, why have you done this? What have I done to you, Ya Allah? I don't accept this. Like what Iblis used to say. He said, See this one that you have made better than me? It's your fault. It's Allah's fault. This is how this kufr. But when you say, Oh Allah, have I done something? Have I angered you? Oh Allah, I complain to you my worries, my sorrows. To make things easy on me is, is, is more, would be better for me. Nothing wrong with that. Cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like a baby. Only him. This is what a mu'min and a strong person does. And then in the end, the Prophet said, And in 
the end, there is no power or might except with you, Allah. Meaning, meaning, nothing can happen to me without your permission, Allah, and I know this. I am in your hands. I am in your hands. As soon as he finished this dua, Adas comes along with a plate of grapes. It's not Adas, it's not Utva, it's not Shaiva, it's none of these people. Who is the one that's bringing him the plate of grapes? He's Allah subhanahu wa The dua gets answered immediately, but in ways that you don't expect. It. The first answering of his dua is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought him a, grape, a plate of grapes. Now, a plate of grapes, you might think, oh, it's just grapes, I'm just going to save them. No, no, no. See, you've got to take yourself 1,400 years ago. And you've got to put yourself in that place. There are no grapes in Makkah. It never grows. You never see grapes. They used to import it from far distances. And when they imported it, they used to make wine with it. And they used to sell it for great prices. And it was the most valuable thing, grapes. So to receive a plate of grapes is the most refreshing, comforting thing that one can do for you. They used to honor themselves by giving their guests grapes. It was the most luxurious and exquisite thing that someone can give. So when someone gives you grapes, it means you are safe, you are protected, it's a comfort, you are his guest. Gave, given him hope, you know, I have not left you. It is said, Allah, on this time or maybe before, that Surah Al-Duha was also sent down. Ma Allah, your Lord has not left you alone. So my brothers and sisters, Adas gives him the, the grape, and the Prophet ﷺ puts his hands up and says, Bismillah. Which shows us that even in the hardest times, the Muslim does not forget their identity. You continue to show it, you're still proud of it. So Bismillah is in the name of Allah. Adas looks at him and says, What are those words? I've never heard them before. He says, it's in the name of Allah, my Lord and Lord. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him, where are you from? He said, I'm from Ninawa. And the Prophet peace be upon him said, Yunus ibn Matta, the Prophet Jonah, son of Matta. Adas looks at him with open eyes. He's about to cry. And he says, who taught you this name? How do you know this name? And how do you know he's from there? I mean, you're talking about months of journey from over there to and he's the only Christian there. Nobody will know this. In a thousand years they wouldn't. The Prophet ﷺ replied by saying, He is my brother, a prophet, and I am a messenger of Allah. Uh, Adas knew what he was talking about. Immediately he fell to the Prophet's knees and began legs and began to kiss them. Shayba looks at his brother Utba and says, look, you sent your slave to look after him. And instead, he put magic on him. He's converted him. We're like, bring him back. He goes and drags Abdas away. And he says, what are you doing, man? Your religion is better than his. He goes, Wallahi, he is a messenger of God. No one knows this knowledge except a messenger. And Abdas was so stubborn in following him in his deen. That even in the Battle of Badr, Adas was still the slave of Utbah. And Utbah was trying to get Adas to go into the battle to fight the Prophet. ﷺ, and he still refused, even if he was dead. This man of Adas, so we consider him a Muslim. So, my brothers and sisters in Islam, this is what happened there. Allah brought him grapes to comfort him. Then he brought him and told him, Look at this man, he's all the way from the other side of the world. If they don't accept your Islam, he has accepted it. So don't worry about these people Allah is giving you. Don't worry. Don't worry. That was a comfort. Immediate response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he strengthened the prophets of Allah. He strengthened his strength. Then the Prophet sallallahu got up and left. With Zayd when everybody else dispersed. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said, I walked and walked and walked. Until, and he also said this to Aisha, he said, I walked until I didn't know where I had ended up. Suddenly I found myself in such a place. A distance away, many kilometers away. And that shows us the Prophet was actually in trauma. That's what happens to you when you're in trauma, you're in shock. 
you walk and walk and you don't realize where you're going. And suddenly you've crossed kilometers and kilometers and kilometers. And then you realize how much you've walked and what you've done. Because you're in shock. There's been no, no tougher time on the Prophet than that time. He says, I wanted, then I rested. And I looked up above me and I saw a cloud. And on that cloud, I saw Jibreel. And he said to me, Allah heard your dua. And he has sent me with the angel of the mountains. If you want, he will do anything you please for what the people of Ta'ib did to you. He said, then I heard the voice, another voice of the angel of the mountains saying, Ya Rasulullah, Allah has sent me to you. Whatever you wish, I will do. If you want me to crush them between the two mountains, because that's where they were, I will do so right now. And there'll be no more ta'if. It'll become extinct. It'll be buried. What did the Prophet ﷺ reply? He said, no. No. If they don't embrace, they don't, they don't save themselves, then maybe Allah will bring from them children later on. Who will worship Allah alone. No parts, no parts. Rasul sallam, doesn't want his own fame. He doesn't want anything from them. He's saying later, yani after he dies, there could be children with their children's children who will worship Allah alone. Don't cut off their chances of entering paradise. And this shows you, my brothers and sisters, that he is a messenger of Allah. Because that's what a messenger of Allah does. He does not come here for fame or fortune or anything else. He's come here truly to save the people with a message from darkness into light. From hell to heaven, to Jannah. To Jannah. Truly, he is, as Allah calls him, "Wama arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil We have not sent you, from Muhammad, for any reason other than as a mercy to all mankind. You are a mercy to the world. Now, check this out. As he was sitting there. Night, night fell. Zayd al Ghulam went to sleep. The Prophet got up to pray. SubhanAllah, even in the hardest times, brothers and sisters, let me repeat. He has no food. He's only got one piece of clothing that is, that is drenched with blood. He hasn't bathed. He's still drenched with blood all over him. He can't. He has no home. He has no wealth. He has no mount. He has no family. He has no protection. He has no wife, nothing. He gets up and prays to Hajj. As he is praying to Hajj, something miraculous happens. Something that looked like dark fog. Zayd says something like dark fog started to come near the Prophet. I got up and the Prophet did this with his hand. Stay where you are. Dark fog encompassed the Prophet. And after the Prophet ﷺ finished, finished his salat, the fog went away. Allah revealed this in the Quran, in Surah Al Jinn. They were a group of jinns. Jinns. They happened to be passing by them. Allah SWT made them pass by them. And they said, Shh, listen. As the Prophet ﷺ was reciting Quran, they said, Shh. To each other. This is, I'm just saying what Allah said in the Quran. They said, shh. What Allah says, well, it's sarafna, in another verse as well, well it's sarafna ilayka nafaram min al jinn. Behold, when we made a group of jinns go past your way, and when they heard the Quran, qalu ansitu. They said to each other, be quiet, listen, listen. What is this? They heard the Quran and they were intrigued by it. They went back to their people. They said, Ya Qawmana, O our people, we have heard words that have never been before. It talks about Moses and like the message of Moses, which shows us that these jinns were what? Which religion? Jews. They were Jewish jinns. <laughs> you guys are not going to sleep tonight. I'm going to scare you. Jinns, my brothers and sisters, 
there are they're like us in, in the sense that they have civilizations, they have nations, they have tribes, they are male and female, they have uh, culture, they uh, have uh, 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 different colors and shapes and languages, different religions. And Allah mentions them in the Quran. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ I have not created the jinn and the humans for any other purpose except to worship me. So the jinns are also created to worship and they are being tested. So they were here before us. And then Allah created the humans. Then they were ordered to pray and worship and fast like us. Now the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad ﷺ, was the only one sent to the entire world, which includes the jinns. And they said that we have heard the Quran unzila min ba'di Musa musaddiqan lima bayna yaday. He is talking about stuff that Moses used to speak about and it confirms it. And then they started to preach to their people, to their jinns, to follow this message. Ya qawmana ajibu da'i Allah. Allah says that the jinns said to their groups, they said, oh, our people respond to the caller of Allah. It's a caller to Allah, to the messengers of Allah. Not only did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala believe and show the Prophet the comfort of jinns, Allah, that, if, the, if the humans are not accepting you, don't worry, the jinns are accepting you. Men from around the world are accepting you, just continue what you have to do and the rest is on us. Here are jinns now, what do you think of that? A life from you they can't even see. And not only did they believe in the Prophet but they also went to become messengers from the Messenger to them. Now the jinns are being called to Islam and saved from the fire. Allah the, the, There are other instances where the Prophet ﷺ gave da'wah to the jinns. At least two other instances. Another one is a time when Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud himself, he says, one time the Prophet ﷺ stood up and he said, who would like to come with me to give da'wah to the jinns? And now the companions, this is all new to you, like, I saw some of your faces go pale. They said, they said no, no, not, not us. We'd rather not go. But Abdullah and Abbas said, I summoned some courage. I was the youngest. You know, children, they like adventure. He told them, hey, something scary. They get scared, but they still want to go. So that he goes, I want to go. He said, I want to come. No one else volunteered. You know, I'm blaming So he went, he said, he went to this near mountain. And, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas says, the Prophet Allah told me to sit near a tree. He told me not to move. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, went. He stood up praying, and then I saw black fog coming towards the Prophet I didn't move. And then suddenly he vanished. The Prophet I couldn't see him. They were surrounding him, and he couldn't be seen. After he finished, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Ya Rasulullah, where were you? You vanished, I was looking for you. He said, don't worry, these were the jinns. Allah sent them to give them da'wah. And I was teaching them about the deen. In another narration, in Sahih Muslim as well, the companions one day got up and they, and they said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam vanished. They didn't know where he went. So we thought maybe he was killed, someone had abducted him. We kept looking all day until the night. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrived, he said, where were you, Rasulullah? He said, I was giving da'wah to the jinns. And if you want, I can come and show you their remnants, what, I left, what they left behind. They went and he showed them some tents. He showed them some fire that they had lit up and it was extinguished. He also said, Abdul, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, that I saw the Prophet bring some bones. Bones and some uh, camel manure. Camel poo. And he said, This, when the jinns embraced Islam, they said, Ya Rasulullah, what are we allowed to eat? Because it's halal and haram food, just like we're not allowed to eat pig, pork, for example, drink alcohol. They said, What can we eat? And the Prophet said, The remaining food of Muslims, you eat and there's stuff that you throw out. Not, not real food, like you're not supposed to waste food, but the stuff that we can't eat, the jinns eat. For example, bones. The jinns eat bones. We can't eat bones. Isn't that correct? So he brought him some bones and he said, this is food for the jinns and also the, the rubbish that you throw out from your food. The, the, the remainder of the Muslims, it becomes the food of the jinns. 
And he also said to them, and the manure of our animals becomes the food of your animals. Which means that the Jews also have animals, livestock, just like us. Okay? I won't tell you more than that. Insha'Allah, I want you to sleep tonight. That these are jinns who are Muslim. And they're good people. My brothers and sisters in Islam. So that's something that happened with the Prophet uh, Then, then, he said, we arrived back in Mecca. And Zayd he says, he's got no protection. So before we entered Mecca, the Prophet tried his best to seek refuge with someone. He sent, he sent some, he sent a message to a few of the chiefs, asking them to give him protection. Because remember, I remind you, the Arabs, if someone gave someone protection, no one's allowed to touch him. This was the law, the, the custom of the Arabs. And whoever touches someone that a clan has protected, then their tribe is humiliated forever. So they didn't want that. But unfortunately, subhanAllah, each chief of Makkah, which he sent a message to to protect him, they rejected him. He even sent to a man called al Ahnas, who later on became Muslim. He sent to Suhail ibn Amr, who later on became Muslim. But you can see the Prophet ﷺ sending to people who he knows they have some goodness in them. And they responded with respect, politely, we can't protect you. We just can't do it. But finally, there was one of the chiefs, his name was Mut'ib ibn Adi. Remember we talked about him before, in classes that have passed. Mut'ib ibn Adi, Mut'ib ibn Adi did not become Muslim. But he was a good man with great wisdom. And he, and he had really good character. Even though he was not a Muslim, he was the only one that offered or accepted to give the Prophet ﷺ protection, including his family. So he said to him, Come to the Kaaba. He came and met him there and he said, You do your tawaf and come and talk to him. So the Prophet ﷺ did tawaf and Mut'im said to his sons, Take your weapons, put them there and cover them. If you cover your weapons, it means that you're not there to fight, but you're there to protect. And go around them. If anyone attacks him, defend him. Who came along? Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan is one of the main chiefs. And he asked Mutai, Have you converted? Or are you protecting? He said, No, I have not converted. I'm protecting. So then Abu Sufyan said to him, We protect and you have protected. If he had converted to Islam, Mutaim was going to get killed too. Mutaim ibn Adi didn't become Muslim and didn't convert. But there was a wisdom. Allah used the situation in a wisdom to protect the Prophet It also shows us that my brothers and sisters, if a person is a kafir, a non-believer, we don't automatically cross them out and say they're evil. The kufr in them is evil. They are evil in the sense of worshipping idols or worshipping something other than God. But generally speaking, there are among them who are naturally good people. They donate, they help, they protect. We have heard of there are many non-Muslims who have gone to, for example, Palestine to protect and stand up for Palestinians and their children. One of them was an American woman. Allah alam what religion she was, but she did something that a mujahid or 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 stuff for Allah. Maybe it's very difficult for some. She stood in front of a, a tank and it ran her over. They ran her over. Another man protecting children, a journalist coming. They shot him while he was. There are people out there who are not Muslim. Not Muslim. We don't dismiss their, their goodness. But this man Mutaim. To give you evidence, when Mut'im ibn Adi died, he died at disbelief. And when the Prophet ﷺ went to Medina later on, and after the Battle of Badr, they took the captives, remember the prisoners? The Prophet ﷺ made a statement in support and honor of this man Mut'im, knowing that he had died a disbeliever with the enemies. He said, if Mut'im ibn Adi was still alive today, and requested of me to 
release all these captives, I would have released them just upon his soul request. So the Prophet Sallallahu honored him. Till today, Muttab Ali is honored for this. The words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. My brothers and sisters in Islam, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was protected for a further, approximately two years before he died, Muttab Ali died. And the protection was gone after close to two years. During that time, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was taken on a journey of Isra and Mi'raj. Jazakumullah khayr. Assalamu alaykum. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam alaykum.